will be speaking anyway. So hopefully by the time uh, he and Diana are ready that he will be unmuted and, and, and speaking. So good morning, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill to get us started. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Jill Lene. I'm gonna move this for a second here. I'm the Assistant Director of Student Services for Osseo Area Schools. And I uh, have the honor of leading this work with uh, Ms. Kate Emmons, who's the Director of Student Services, uh, Sarah Vernon, who's our district level principal, who cannot be with us today. Um, and uh, we also have another member of the team that's not with us, uh, Tim Palmatier, who's our general counsel. Uh, today, we also have Diana Bledsoe and Alex Bird from Northview Middle School that will be sharing uh, an example of the work that we do in Osseo Area Schools. So welcome everybody. If you hear dogs barking, I apologize. So welcome to Osseo. Osseo is a quaint little town. Um, and so we thought we'd just show you a little picture of what downtown Osseo looks like. If you haven't been there, go check it out. Okay. So we have a quote that, um, that we kind of believe holds true. So it's from Rob Horner. Never put something in place that won't endure for a minimum of 10 years. Do it with a level of precision, with a level of fidelity, and with the organi organizational systems that will go beyond just you getting good at it. And I think in Osiris schools, uh, this is kind of a quote that we actually uh, live up to. I'm following along on a separate screen, so just bear with me for one second here. Okay, so Osseo Area Schools is the fifth largest district in Minnesota. We have over 21,000 students and we have 80 dialects and languages spoken within our district. We have 17 elementary schools, four middle schools, three comprehensive high schools, an OALC, two early childhood centers, and we have a transition program as well as an OALC and ABE and an enrollment center. So if you wanna take a look at our demographics, um, we're finally hitting the tipping point where our students of color are uh, outnumbering our white students. So that's one great thing we have in Osseo area schools. We have a lot of uh, racial diversity, cultural, linguistic. Um, it's one of the reasons I love working in the district that I work in. Mm -hmm. You can just take a look at that for a minute. Oh, you want me to go back? No, it's okay. Okay. They'll have access to it. So one thing in our series schools is we live by our mission and our mission is to inspire and prepare all students with the confidence, courage and competence to achieve their dreams, contribute to community and engage in a lifetime of learning. So everything we do in our district ties back to our mission, um, which is about supporting our learners. Um, you can see that we have goals, we have strategies and we have core values. So our strategic priority leadership every year, we adjust this and it comes straight from our superintendent and our cabinet members. So you can see that all of our strategic priority work stems directly from our mission, our goals and our core values, all arrows pointing in one direction. Each of our priority areas has a cabinet member sitting on, um, so they're able to report back to the school board on our progress um, in between when we are able, not able to get in front of our school board. Um, as you can see, ours is, here's ours right here with the arrow pointing at it. All sites will implement culturally responsive research-based practice, positive behavior intervention practices that include the use of trauma-informed and restorative practices. Um, and as I said, that was Kate, Tim, Jill, and or myself and Sarah that are leading that work. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we are interweaving all of those into our priority work, um, also including a focus on racial equity. Okay. 
Okay, so first of all, this was back in the beginning um, with our partnership with MDE. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank some of our partners. So I, uh, on behalf of Osteria Schools, I'd really like to thank Eric Clues, Janet Christensen, Aaron Barnes, Alex Mugambi, and Lauren Squire with Metro Exu. You have been invaluable partners for us. And um, we actually get really excited every time you come to our meetings and we get to spend time with you. <laughs> um, so if you guys, most of you watching, I'm sure are aware of the uh, partnership give and get um, if you're working with MDE, but really what it is, is it's to set the priority, which is to um, implement PBIS with fidelity um, and uh, really drive the data decision making, ensure that there's pro professional development that is on a consistent basis and it touches staff that have been with us, and it also is um, shared with staff that are new to us. Uh, we also have set meeting dates um, where we meet as a large district team. Uh, so we have one PBIS lead that's nominated from their building principal, someone that they think can um, actually impact the work. And we meet monthly and go over topics, but you'll see that in a couple of slides ahead. Um, we also meet um, with MDE to go over our DCA. Um, and so really this is our playbook, guidebook on how we implement MD, how we implement PBIS in partnership with the Department of Education. Next slide. Okay, so the fidelity, the TFI. So if you're aware of the TFI, the Terry Fidelity Inventory, it really uh, is a tool that gives us, uh, in my mind, it gives us both a summative and formative measure of how we are doing with PBIS implementation, tier one, tier two, tier three, um, across all of our 26 sites. Um, so, it's a roadmap for us and we use it for reporting our results to the school board. We use it for um, maybe uh, Kate, Sarah, or myself uh, giving a little extra support to schools, going out and supporting them in their PBIS processes. Um, and it's really a roadmap for us to support schools in the areas where they might be a little lower in the TFI than we'd like below the 70%. Um, to help them come up with an action plan to increase um, their ratings on the TFI. So what you're seeing here is our tier one TFI uh, PBS implement implementation across schools. You'll notice that there's like two schools that really our flat line right there. Um, that's because they didn't get us the data on time. But you can see in 2018, 17 of our sites um, completed the, the TFI. Um, and now if we go to the next slide, which is 1819, you can see that we have, now we're really looking at tier two here. The last one was tier one. So now you can really see that we already have 12 schools that are above the minimum 70% with fidelity of implementation of tier two interventions. And there's multiple reasons for that. The past two years, we've really been focusing in on tier two interventions. We spent a lot of time um, really drilling in the tier one for all um, aspects of PBIS, but the past two years, we've been really moving towards um, <clears throat> supporting schools in tier two interventions. Um, one way we've done this is uh, this year, uh, 1920 was the first year that we partnered with the U of M and we implemented the system called IM4. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but what IM4 is, it's a, um, it's a problem solving platform, digital, that allows schools to, uh, I would, 
it kind of parallels like a plan do study act cycle. Um, so what it's really doing is it's matching uh, an appropriate evidence based tier two intervention with a student um, that either has a performance deficit or an acquisitional skill deficit. And uh, this year for 2021 will be our second year. So we'll really start to get some movement um, in that. So it's really helped our teams understand the problem solving process and know that they have to actually collect data to see what the issue is with the student or the lagging skill. Uh, how to match it with a correct evidence-based intervention to meet, to review, is the intervention working? And if it's not, adjust. So it's been a great tool for us. Next slide, please. So what we're looking at here is the TFI. Uh, you can see tier one, tier two, tier three, and this is for 15, 16. So this is a while ago. Um, so we started requiring all uh, of our sites to take the TFI in 2015. Uh, mostly, they most likely they were over-reporting because um, the TFI can be subjective, uh, but we started in 2015. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, you can see in, oops, in 1819 results, you can see the administration of the TFI Tier two from the previous slide increased to 24 sites participating from 12 in 2015. So we're making progress. And I think Kate's going to jump in here and talk a little bit about our DERS data. I am. And so as you can see with this data, it looks like over time that we have made improvements. So the important thing isn't that you can see, I mean, the important thing is probably that you can see our data because it's, um, we like to look at it. But if the other part is, is that you know your data. You should be looking at your data, making data informed decisions because there's no way that we're ever gonna convince anybody else about the efficacy of PBIS implementation unless we can show results. So our school board does not have a lot of interest and maybe like yours, not a, a lot of interest in fidelity of implementation where we say this many people um, are, you know, have a team, this many people are uh, meeting together, this many people have a coach, this, whatever those are, they just don't have an interest in it because they, like many other school boards and uh, superintendents are interested in, in the bottom line. So if there's one thing that I can encourage you to do is to know your data backwards, forwards, six ways from Sunday. Now, this shows that we have made progress, but I will say what the other interesting thing about this is, um, is that according to our school board, it's like, well, PBIS isn't working. Well, okay, so it works for students receiving special education services, but look, all students in general ed, they were already fine. So the other thing to do is to disaggregate your data and disaggregate it again and know your data. Where is it? So the American Indian um, population, if you look at this, you'll see that in um, approximately 2017, there was a huge spike. The other thing is, is to know what that number is because that's not a huge number. We have um, a limited number of students um, American Indian students who are receiving special education services, which is what the gray line indicates, and little deviations make for huge spikes. So when trying to describe your data, make sure that you understand what it is that you're talking about, be able to talk about it. And here's the other truth, is that until such time as it makes a difference to um, each and every parent in your district, showing them the data isn't going to be of any interest to them because they'll say, well, where's my child in this? So really the use of data is so that you can do data informed decision making. You need to be able to take a look at this and say, where are gaps? Where are we still struggling? And as you can see with our data, we need to pay more attention to students of color who are black. And believe me, we do pay attention because in, you know, the one thing else in ASIO is that it is all through an equity lens. 
PBIS in and of itself does not stand alone. It needs to be done through an equity lens. So whose voices are making the decisions? Whose voices are we looking at? And by looking at this data, we know that we need to include more students of color in our, um, in our conversations. We're making progress, yes, and we still have more to do. And Jill. So this is probably one of my favorite parts about co-facilitating the work of PBIS. I love our monthly meetings. Um, I don't know. I know Kate's not going to jump back on, but I guess there's probably like, I don't know, 30, 35 uh, staff members that attend our monthly meetings. Um, and you can see an example of our agenda here. This agenda, uh, you can see we were focusing on intervention strategies. So we were focusing on uh, anxiety. Um, which is one of the acquisitional uh, strategies from the IM4 system. So we presented on that. You can also see that we have the Clear Solutions Framework, which is going to be coming up in two slides, which is one of our core equity tools. So yes, we do call out race in each of our meetings, and we focus on systems that are in place that are not helping our students. So our monthly meetings, um, we always, uh, it's not a sit and get, it's really interactive. We have activities, we introduce new interventions. Um, sometimes we have guest speakers like Janet Christensen, who will go over our data for us. Uh, but overall, they're really fun and they're great meetings. And the purpose of the meeting is that the uh, point person that attends the meeting brings it back to their PBIS team and shares the information um, so it gets back to each and every site. Um, so that's kind of a sample of our agenda and our monthly meetings. Uh, one, I just don't, okay, yeah. Uh, one thing I want to add before I go on to this slide is, is at the end of the, each year, we have a celebration. Uh, and this year it was virtual, so that was really interesting to do. Um, but yeah, so each school will come in, present uh, their PBIS work for the year. Usually we have it at a location and we invite all of the principals and a lot of times they bring some students to actually add student voice and talk about how they experience PBIS in their building. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that, I think in a couple of slides too. Okay, I'm ready now. So we really are uh, believers of the Plan Do Study Act uh, improvement process. This year, uh, we required sites to do a Plan Do Study Act, and they had to do it through a racial equity lens, uh, and they also had to tie it to their site's behavioral uh, site improvement goal. So that's what they reported out on. Um, I can't remember a month ago, a couple months ago, everything's blurring, but we had like 26 sites that all presented their PDSAs that were tied to racial equity work and to their site improvement uh, plan, specifically the behavioral goal. Um, and it was really fun to see um, all the amazing work that's being done across our district. So this is a lot to look at if you're not familiar with it, but this is one of my favorites and it's pretty much one of our core uh, system equity tools. Uh, what this tool really does is um, you isolate an event. So let's say for example, um, students of color are being, you're noticing that a certain group of students of color are being suspended in your site uh, more often than others. You dig more into it, you look for patterns. Do we have patterns of really not suspending our white students the same as we are our black students? Or how do we define insubordination for one versus the other? Then you look at the systems that are in place and you look at the mental models that are behind those systems. So this side of the um, framework is really looking at consciousness and then you're going to move from the left down and now you're getting the conviction so you know what mental models you know the systems that need to be interrupted so now you want to move up the right side 
and you're going to come up with new mental models, new systems that are going to interrupt the events and the patterns that you're seeing. So this is the tool that was used um, by our PBIS teams uh, to attach to the work of their PDSA and their behavioral SIP goal at each site. And I think I could say a thousand more things, but I think it's time to turn it over so you can actually see the real work down at the student level. So I want to turn it over to the lovely Miss Diana Bledsoe and Alex Berg. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, my name is Diana Bledsoe, principal of Northview Middle School. Thank you for having us here to talk about our implementation of the PDSA to improve student outcomes. Next slide, please. Our goal was to reset and cultivate our building's climate and culture. We began our process with a thorough review of our current reality, our then current reality. We looked at perception data from staff, students, and families, reviewed achievement data, enrollment data, discipline data, and so on. We knew that with this review, it, it would provide us with an opportunity to identify what was working and potentially sunset ineffective practices. And we started this process at the study portion of the PDS process. Next slide, please. As for the process, this began informally in the 2016-2017 school year. The building's equity team worked through the iceberg model of analysis process at a district level equity team professional development opportunity. Our goal was to identify what was getting in the way of our student success. And this initial review at that time then set the stage for a whole scale review of building work. This whole scale review helped us to determine that our IB programming model was not meeting its intended outcomes and unintentionally causing undue strain on our building. There was resource misalignment, master scheduling concerns, isolation from district level initiatives, and in the end, we weren't meeting the needs of our adolescents or supporting our staff. And in the spring of 2017, we declared that it was time for a change. We declared that we would remove the IB programming model from our building and align our programming model with the rest of the district's middle schools and embed middle level best practice throughout our building. This allowed us to review everything that we did including how we implement positive behavioral interventions and supports. Next slide, please. As we prepared for action, we wanted to ensure that honest self-study, inclusive decision-making, and transparency was present throughout this process. Our honest self-study has allowed us to set clear priorities and develop a robust evaluation process that we can continue to implement and refine today. The inclus inclusive decision-making process we use has provided us with a staff that's committed to Northview Middle School, the work that we do, and as you will see shortly, improve student outcomes in the way we support students and respond to student behavior. Lastly, our commitment to transparent leadership has helped us develop a staff culture that is supportive, collaborative, and trusting of administration, all of which is required for improved student outcomes. Next slide, please. As we began to take action, we used the same process to build our new reality as we did to re-examine our then current reality. But instead of moving down the iceberg model of analysis, we began our ascent to our new reality, utilizing a collaborative pr planning process that is still used today. Next slide, please. We first created a transition team that was composed of members of administration, staff from a variety of departments, and the building's union representation. Basically, everyone was invited. We said, come one, come all, we want you at the table for success. This team began by collaboratively identifying what a successful transition would entail. I know change is hard, you know change is hard, and we knew that we had to manage this change in a supportive way. We then moved to examine our be values, beliefs, and attitudes. The good news for us was that our values, beliefs, and attitudes were fairly aligned. We just needed to align our practices. This realization of alignment pro provided us with a strong platform to build upon. 
And as we envisioned what we need, what would need to be in place to ensure that we would provide an inclusive and responsive environment that empowers and inspires our students, we leaned in on that mindset alignment throughout this process. Next slide, please. For our planning purposes, we used a cyclical and three-step approach that was built off of our tran transition team's initial analysis. Administration would make recommendations based on transition team analysis. We would then gather stakeholder feedback, and then the transition team would, ana would analyze this feedback and determine suggested next steps. Four, admin to review and then make recommendations. This cyclical process ensured that multiple perspectives were always included and elevated in the decision making process. And my belief that this is and this is right now and was the key to our success. The one change that we have right now is we don't have a transition team anymore. What we have now is a building leadership team composed of department chairs along with non licensed staff representation. But this cyclical process still um, is present in our building today. Next slide please. From that planning process, we were able to do many things, two of which were to establish an identity and change mindsets. Identity development was very important to us because it solidified who we aspired to be and how we aspired to get there. And it required us to commit to specific practices to support our students. We were also able to change mindsets through this process. We moved from an individualistic or departmentalized culture to one that embraces teamwork. As a result of this mind shift, our staff now embraces the saying, teamwork makes the dream work, and consistently indicates that one of our greatest strengths is our collaborative and supportive staff culture. We've shifted from a culture where administrators had to hold staff accountable and staff had to hold students accountable to one where we strive to help each other be accountable. We set high expectations for ourselves and provide a high level of support for each other to reach those expectations. We've moved from a place where we, where we were hyper-focused on consequences and referral follow-through to one where we prioritize relationships as a way, to be, a way to improve student behavior because we believe that no significant learning can happen without a significant relationship. And lastly, we have embraced the practice of considering multiple racial and cultural perspectives when making decisions, because we believe that our diversity is our strength and we strive to elevate our students and family voice to ensure that all stakeholders feel empowered to make positive contributions to our school community. Next slide, please. We also changed many of our practices. Our instructional goal now, as it's related to PBIS, is to create classroom systems that efficiently and effectively support consistent implementation of expectations, pro-social skill development, and tier one supports. One of the ways we do that is through our grade level engagement plan, for example. This establishes a consistent classroom environment for student success across the building, in each house, and at each grade level. We do this by ensuring that identified best practices related to a cultivating a positive classroom environment are universally implemented in each and every classroom. A student at Northview Middle School is no longer required to figure out a teacher's expectation and style. Instead, our staff have aligned their expectations and corresponding practices to provide a consistent experience for our students. Our classroom standards of practice are an example of this and have expectations for teaching and learning in the building, whether that be everything from purposeful seating or grouping to the direct instruction and how we informally or formally assess students during the class period. And we also have classroom standardization for practices associated with classroom routines, how students enter the room, what students do to ready themselves for classroom via a warm up how lesson objectives and the day's agenda is communicated, how expectations for group or individual work time is communicated to students, and how students prepare themselves to leave the room for the day. Our goal is to provide as much consistency in those areas to, to support our students. To help staff be accountable to these practices, we implement a pretty robust process for this as well. And that begins with our informal observation process. 
This is a weekly process where our instructional leadership team informally assesses fidelity to our classroom standards. We do this by visiting classrooms and providing feedback to our staff. And then I then provide biweekly updates to the building on our fidelity rate by grade level and by department. To support staff with this process, we provide training and a peer observation process. This is a required process for all staff. It's completed by both licensed and non-licensed staff three times a year, and it allows staff to see best practices in action. Uh, with this, we've opened the doors to each other and our practices, and I believe we've grown immensely because of it. We've also changed the way we proactively engage our students, and Mr. Berg will tell you more about this. Mr. Berg, are you here? I am here. How do I sound? You sound amazing, sir. Thank you for saying so. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, as, as Diana said, my name is Alex Berg. I'm the assistant principal in Northview Middle School, and um, we could switch to the next slide this time. Uh, alongside those changes in practice to our instructional culture, uh, we have a series of changes we made to what we uh, sort of loosely summarize as proactive engagement. That is a broad term and a lot sort of fits under that umbrella, but I'm going to walk you through some of the big things right now. Uh, and Dinah had mentioned the grade level engagement plan. That, that has as much to do with instruction as it does engagement. There are things like um, just routines at the be beginning of class and, um, you know, having teachers at their door, greeting students as they come in um, that, that are designed to, to create that consistent student experience across uh, all classrooms and grade levels. We, <clears throat> at the start of these changes, implemented a pretty well-defined tiered response to student behavior. In many, many ways, it actually aligns with the PBIS pyramid, you know, the green, yellow, red, uh, and how, um, <clears throat> you know, giving us a, a sort of standard structured process for how we are going to begin to engage uh, and account for student need. Um, we, we had weekly grade level meetings before we sort of began this transition, but they changed in pretty much every way uh, as a result of it. We, um, you know, under the old model, they tend to focus a lot on sort of logistical things that were coming up or, or, or challenges here and there that would sort of pop up in the moment. And in many cases, frankly, I think they would just devolve into uh, vent sessions uh, when we would get to talking about student Concerns. So we went back, pretty much took it all away, restructured them so that there was a very specific process that was really focused on action item and outcome when talking about students. We also, uh, and this was a major change in the way we did things, we restructured it so that every other week, so twice a month, all staff would go through a little mini um, professional development session on restorative practice or our restorative practices. And what that helped us do, I think, was maintain a focus throughout the year instead of stacking all of our, our PD and workshop week back in August and then, you know, it sort of fades throughout the year. This really sustained the focus on restorative practices and restorative language throughout the school year and helped create sort of a common uh, like a shared language almost between staff and students. Um, and that, that was impactful. Our feedback told us that. We embedded opportunities for staff leadership in everything that we've talked about here. Um, and, and that was to one, just gain perspectives to make sure we had that sort of equity of voice involved in this major transformation of the building, uh, but also to just create buy-in. And to, and to encourage staff to take ownership over, over what we were doing and the outcomes we were seeking. And then lastly, we didn't, we didn't go into it with this all hands on deck term, but it sort of evolved and almost became a mantra of ours. And it very simply kind of boils down to a mindset that every single student is every single staff member's responsibility. So if, for example, a seventh grade student is skipping class, that is not exclusively the seventh grade teacher's problem or, or something for the hall monitor manage, that becomes all of our responsibility. And as a staff member, if you see it, you have an obligation, a duty to positively engage and, and help us um, get that student back on the right track. Uh, and it does start on the ground level, but it has really kind of transcended everything um, and become sort of accepted practice. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, and also within this, and this is a big thing I couldn't move on without mentioning, <clears throat> we have, and actually I, I think maybe I uh, gave this one its own slide because it's maybe the most tangible and visible way in which PBIS shows up uh, in Northview. But we have implemented a series of monthly incentives, recognitions, and rewards. Uh, and we've specifically built up to that point where every single month there's some big recognition or event happening, it pretty much leaves students in a constant cycle of something to look forward to. But it's not just that simple. Students also have to earn it because we're setting high expectations. There's a series of fairly consistent academic and attendance and behavior related criteria for each of these events uh, for students to be able to participate. Typically we get about 75-80% of students earning the recognition or the, the reward uh, every month, which is pretty good and that varies of course month to month. Um, I included some pictures here just because I think it kind of I don't know, breathes life or, or provides some examples of what, what I'm really talking about and, and how this really does matter, that fun does matter uh, within a culture when you're trying to have a just overall safe and positive feeling climate. Got a picture of a school dance there over on the left. Um, that was a trip to, to the Mall of America for uh, some students who had earned it. You can go to the next slide if you like. Um, and again, just some more, I won't break them down individually, but just it kind of, I tried to paint a picture of the variety of things that we put out there uh, for students to really kind of get excited about. Uh, we, the, the top left, we have a big twice a year, we do a really big raffle week. Um, that's us raffling off donuts during lunch. Uh, there was a photo booth at the Valentine's dance. We had some students there who organized a food drive. We recognized them for that. Eighth graders can earn a big Valley Fair field trip every year, glow in the dark dodgeball, uh, so on and so forth. So anyways, it's, it's kind of, like I said, it's what really shows up and, and it has helped us in what really amounts to a shift. And Diana kind of mentioned this away from an emphasis on um, the infraction or the behavior, uh, and instead putting the emphasis, the spotlight completely on the desired behavior uh, and the many, many positive things that are that are happening within the school, which sometimes in our in our past life um, got lost in everything. So uh, you can you can move on to the next slide now if you like. Uh, and you know, I think it's also important, and Kate really hammered this this emphasis on data home earlier in this presentation. But it isn't all fun and games. Beneath the celebrations and the high fives and the, the dancing and all that, there is a real strategy and science to what we're doing. It is very much data driven. Um, and so I wanted to share a few graphs with you. I tried to really um, condense these down and make them digestible. Uh, I won't draw your attention to every single data point just in the interest of time. Um, but I will show you some of the, the bigger things that we look at that both have shaped how we have gotten to where we're at and also help us um, sort of chart a course for where we know we need to go. The first one here summarizes uh, what I consider the significant unsafe behaviors uh, within the school fighting assaults and weapons that have happened over the last four school years, including this year. Um, I think that it is important to focus on fighting in particular. Uh, for our purposes, you can probably spot it there. It's the big blue line across the top. Um, fighting, if you've, if you've been in a school where fights happen, you know that it can really create an unsettled feeling uh, throughout the building. It can induce anxiety and make people just not feel great about coming to school. And so that was something really important for us to get under wraps. Um, three years ago, 2017, 18, you see we peaked with 106 incidents in which a student was coded as a participant in a fight. 106, that's a lot. That was one of the um, highest, highest in the district actually at that point. That year is when all this planning that we've been talking about here was really put into place. And over that summer, heading into the 2018-19 year is when virtually all of these changes we've discussed began to take shape. And you can see the impact was instantaneous. We had a dramatic decline of over 50% just in that first year. Uh, and then this year, um, that number in parentheses, and this will be the case for all the graphs, that number in parentheses is actually what we were at when we left uh, in mid-March for uh, COVID-related reasons. We were at 29 students being coded as participants in a fight. I also, just for the sake of comparison, uh, projected that, what we were on pace for, meaning 43. Uh, and um, 
Oh, we got a question here. Uh, I'll, I'll finish this and then answer it. Um, the, uh, we were on pace for 43. And so what you can see is that 60%, uh, we had a, over 60% decline in fights in two years. And that definitely helps us uh, know where we're at and that, that what we're doing is having an impact. I think the question, it kind of just disappeared off my screen was, how do we code fights? It is, it is, uh, has to be a full-blown um, fight, physical altercation. We don't consider slap boxing, play fighting. Those, those are not considered um, fights. And so really a single fight between two kids, two students would actually be coded as two different. This is, this is not a hundred, like that not 106 number doesn't show 106 fights. It shows 106 participants in a fight. I hope that clears that up. Okay. You can go to the next slide. The next layer to that then, great, uh, is incident reporting. The blue line shows referrals or ODRs or whatever you might call them. Uh, that line has stayed steady and I'm actually okay with that. I think that is part of our um, emphasis on data collection and consistency in data collection as a means of driving the interventions that we put in place. The line that you should pay attention to is that orange one. That is for what we call a reflection room, but I think most schools have some equivalent. It's, it's basically where kids get sent when they get thrown out of class for behavior related reasons. Um, we didn't keep track of that four years ago, uh, but when we started keeping track, you can see in 17, 18, we had over 5,000 reflection room visits in the course of a school year. Uh, if it sounds like a lot, it is. Um, it averages out to about 28 or 29 students being sent to that room per day uh, over the course of a year. The changes went into effect that summer. You can see the instantaneous decline over uh, close to 3,000. And then this year we were sitting at just over 1,000 when we left. Um, on pace for 1600. Uh, and why I point this number out is suspension tends to get all the attention out of school suspension, but in a way these almost more uh, consistently contribute to a loss of instructional time, which is really what this is all about. And if you even factor in an average of 20 minutes, let's say per reflection room visit, which is a conservative estimate, we're talking about hundreds of hours over the course of a year uh, that we've gained back through some of these changes. And I'll say a little bit more that more about that after this next slide. What should be coming up? You can go to the next slide if you're in control. There you go. Action counts. These are those big things that result uh, in lost instructional time. The orange line is pass. Um, some schools call it alternative suspension, ATS, in-school suspension, ISS, whatever you call it, we, we call it PASS. And you can see over the last several years, I mean, we were sitting at 845 four years ago. We've gotten that number down to 364. Oh, that's what we were on pace for, actually less than that in person. Um, the blue line at the bottom, that's the big one that, that, again, that we tend to focus on, that is suspension, out of school suspension. Those are singular incidents. Uh, and they could range anywhere from one to five days, um, typically on the lower end of that scale, but many, many are more than one. Three years ago, we peaked, and again, this is one of the district high scores of 239. The changes went into effect. We dropped to 105, and then this year, we were at 49 on pace for 73. That represents, if we had done that, and again, I believe that number would have actually been lower, just because we tend to kind of ease up at the end of the year. Um, that's a 70% decline in the course of two years. So we feel good about that, but there's also this other side of the data that I wanted to briefly touch on. And that is, and we encountered this at Northview when we started to put these changes into effect. If you start to experience declines, I think uh, on some of these, these discipline metrics, but yet the building still feels unsafe or feels chaotic, the data, or when you talk about the declines, it's met with a fair amount of skepticism, like, are these numbers being sort of artificially manufactured just to appear better on the outside, but really on the inside, it's no better. We wanted to supplement this info with um, data from a climate survey that we began to implement three years ago. And you can switch to the next slide at any point here. Uh, and, and this is a really sort of 40, 50 question climate survey. We make a big deal out of this. We really push for 100% participation among staff and, and we get really close every time. Um, and I picked out a few things to show you that I think supplement that that behavior data I just I was just uh, that was just on the screen. 
two of the questions we asked on it are how would you rate the implementation of PBIS and how would you rate the implementation of restorative practices? There were five possible ways to respond, ranging from terrible to excellent. Uh, this graph just shows the top two, which are the two that we're striving for. You can see in regards to both three years ago, we were at 27 and 34%. Those numbers should be reversed, but you get the idea. Um, we grew the next year and now this year we're sitting at 71 and 66% uh, uh, rating that as excellent or good. That's considerable growth. We know that those numbers can get better. And frankly, just as a little background, the group in which we have to engage better, we know moving forward, our custodial group and our kitchen staff, they represent about 15% of the people who take this survey. Um, but frankly, in terms of PBIS or restorative practices, we haven't involved those groups as much as we should have. And I think that represents how we're going to make that leap up into the high 80s, low 90s percent in terms of excellent or good uh, in regards to PBIS and restorative practices. You can go to the next one. And if I'm running long here, feel free to just cut me off at any point. Uh, we also asked these two questions, which I think are important. Uh, we asked staff, how strongly do you agree with these statements? I feel, uh, I feel that Northview Middle School is safe, and I feel that Northview Middle School is welcoming. Three years ago, you can see we're hovering right around 50%, which, frankly, as an administrator, that is a bit of a gut punch to, to take in that half of your staff don't feel safe when they come every day or don't feel welcome. Uh, the changes, again, majority of them went into effect. You see the immediate growth. And this year, we were sitting in, in 91 and 87% respectfully in both of those regards. That is hugely important to us. Uh, I think also speaks to kind of the direction we're headed in. And then one more, I think. Very simply, we asked a question, yes or no, two questions. Would you recommend Northview Middle School to students and families? And would you recommend Northview Middle School to prospective staff members. We did not ask that staff member on the orange line three years ago. I don't know why, but that's, that's why it's missing. Uh, and you can see that, but with, with the student question, that first year, 47%, which coincidentally is right around that mark of people responding whether they felt safe or welcome. I'm sure there's a correlation there. But the changes went into effect and the people answering yes on this has steadily climbed up to the point of 94% saying they would recommend Northview, 86% saying they would recommend students and families. And that to me, honestly, when, we, when I crack this survey open uh, every year to read the results, I scan down to that one. That's the first one I look at because the degree to which I think staff would want to bring people into our building and, and endorse the building and speak to our strengths, I think is a good indicator of, of, at least internally from a staff perspective, um, evidence of, of what we're doing and where it's headed. And so I believe I have one more slide in here. Yes, and this is an important one to end on. I know what we're specifically planning to do in the future doesn't necessarily uh, apply or matter to anyone here, but I think it's really important because, you know, the data, the graphs, they are important, but I don't share it to just more or less uh, pat ourselves on the back or, or to just say we've done it, we celebrate. Really a key part of this process is that we remain in, a, remain in a constant state of reflection and always focus on what we can do to get better. We have to, we know, continue to redefine what PASS or ATS or ISS, whatever you call it, uh, is or what it can be. We have taken steps to infuse sort of restorative uh, element in there, opportunities to repair harm. But we also next year have a plan where we're going to address the um, what we call the rate of recidivism, which is basically those students who are just perpetually in and out of pass or ETS every other week. And what do we do to to meet them uh, at, at a better place? Because clearly what we've been doing hasn't hasn't broken the pattern for some. We need to continue to take a more responsive approach to restorative practices. And that really means zeroing in on the individual students, moving away from a kind of one size fits all, hey, let's do a circle kind of thing, and really getting into individual students and what they need. And again, that correlates very closely to that PBIS pyramid in terms of the tiers. We need to better engage parents and families. We have made good growth with that in the last year or so, um, but we, we know we can do better. We have some plans for that. Uh, we want to just continue to build up, refine and expand upon our celebrations and recognitions. Just keep making them more fun, more enticing, more appealing, more of a true recognition and, and sign of our appreciation for the hard work and effort that, that our, our Northview Knights are putting in. And lastly, like I kind of I kind of tipped off at the beginning of this, we got to continue to ask the question, how do we how do we elevate? How do we keep moving forward? Um, 
Ms. Bledsoe and I have been around long enough to know that these positive numbers that I've shared with you, they can nosedive in a hurry if we don't keep uh, our foot on the gas pedal and continue to push forward and, and use the positive results as we've seen, again, not as a way to celebrate and say we did it, congratulations, but rather to, as a mandate to keep moving and, and to keep adding on to what we're doing um, because we, we know what we think Northview is capable of and, and we still have a ways to go um, to get there. And so that is a snapshot. I think that's the end. There it is. That's our logo. Uh, I just want to thank you. Re reiterate what Diana said and say thanks to everyone here uh, for this opportunity. We love to talk about Northview and Osseo area schools. And I believe our emails are in here somewhere. Um, you can uh, uh, certainly shoot us an email with any questions or follow up that, that you might have. And that's everything. Going to unmute here. Thank uh, Diana and Alex because as much as we do the work at the district level, it is at the sites and you saw from Diana and Alex the amazing interpretation and implementation of this work. So there are things to hold tight to and things to let go of. So the things to hold tight to is the strategic work. We need to always remember that we are involved in a district and not just, it's just not Kate Emmons saying, I think this is a good idea. There's a really good reason that we chose PBIS for our um, behavioral kind of focus, the positive behavior interventions and supports. It is evidence-based, it's tiered interventions, it's got a wide, um, uh, wide research base to back up if you implement that it will be done. So that's the work of me, Jill, Sarah, and Tim is to keep that strategic, the, the district, all arrows moving in the same way. And implementation science, don't give up. Oh my goodness. You saw Diana and Alex's data from a few years ago. Boy, howdy. I mean, and, and that was, you know, there were years before that is, so you think it's is this working? Oh my gosh, is this working? Could it possibly work? Don't give up. Remember the Rob Horner uh, quote at the beginning, there are lots of things that um, look like the shiny, the next shiny bright thing. Um, and we as an educational system need to get off that hamster wheel. So remember implementation science and our friends at MDE know all about that. Ellen Nasik, uh, uh, Aaron Barnes, Janet Christensen, um, Aaron Farrell, who's with us today, they all know about it. And if you need help with it, that I can't even imagine them saying no to you. Yes, you need to conduct the TFI twice a year. If that's the question we get from science, um, from our sites. Really, really, yep, 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 because it helps knowing if we are on track for implementation. And adhere to the evidence base that the intervention is based on, no wild hairs. So there are things that say, if you do this, you will get this. And the PBIS um, research base is very specific on that. Now there's you know, the three to five positively stated behavior expectations, the teaching, the reteaching, your data, your system of acknowledgement, and so on. So adhere to that. And then also adhere to what do you believe about students? I think you heard Diana, Alex, and Jill all speak about what is it that we believe about students with our iceberg work? That's what it comes down to. Do you believe that each and every child in your system deserves the best that you have to give them? Do, do, does each and every child in your system deserve to live the life they want to live? And I heard, I heard Diane and Alex talk about that, is that their beliefs and their values were aligned. It was in the actions that they were not as aligned, but their beliefs were there. But unless you check and, and recheck with people that you keep coming back to, what are your core beliefs? What is your mental models? What are your mindsets about what do you want for your students? So hold tight to those. Now you may have other things in your system, but those are the things in our system that we keep coming back to. And, and one of the things that isn't stated here, but you have to call out race. You, because not every child in our system is experiencing the school day in the same way that others are. 
And we have um, seen that clearly with our data that our black students are not experiencing the day in the same way that we want for, um, for everybody. So that's something else that we have to um, hold tight to is calling out race. Some things you just gotta let it go. And, and I know um, you'll see that I am the one who is doing the, you know, turning on the, you know, the next slide, the next slide, the next slide. So some of it is like, I have to learn to let go. I had to, been in this for nine years, had to learn to let go. How schools interpret positively stated behavior, behavior expectations. There is no one right way. Like it must be respect, responsibility, and I don't know what else, but whatever they are because every school has their own community, their own student and family voice, and their own way of interpreting positively stated behavior expectations, night pride, the bulldog way. It is about developing the culture. Let it go from a district standpoint. Now, if you're um, watching this from a site, hold tight to it because you want your community to interpret that. You wanna get a very common, um, belief system around that. And then how schools will engage student voice. So I um, have some um, ideas about that. I have ideas about a lot of things, um, surprisingly, but that isn't my job at the district level. It's not Jill's job, it's not Sarah's job. It is the work of our folks like Diana and Alex and the host of other school leaders that how will they engage the student voice. Now, five years ago, we didn't talk about that. Six years ago, we didn't talk about that. We started probably in about five years ago saying, okay, so where, where are the kids? Where's the kids' voices in this? But we know that that is critically important, but how they do it, uh, they are brilliant at engaging their own um, voices. And there's like a whole lot, a whole lot more that we could let go of. Um, and if I were to ask Diane and Alex things that they'd like me to let go of, they'd probably have a list. But fortunately, they're booted. So on that, I want to thank you for uh, being with us today. And here are our um, email addresses, because if there's anything that we can reach out um, and you want us to help or you just want to pass an idea by, if it's at the site level, Alex and Diana, Diana and Alex are amazing, uh, very good at interpreting and, and getting at the thing and it, uh, getting at uh, the host of things you have to think about at the school level and then jill sarah and i even though sarah's not here she's got something else going on we would be more than happy from a district perspective to assist with that and i saw in the chat box i just don't want to do one quick shout out to mark french i saw that he is there so hi mark i hope they're treating you well and uh, we miss you so, and thank you to everybody else who participated with us. And I think with that, that we are on time and we're gonna say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful presentation. I love seeing all of the, the data and the journey that you guys have been on. Um, uh, if there are any questions, we might have a couple of minutes if you're willing to take um, any questions. Um, and then just a reminder, we will start the next session at 11 o'clock. And in this link, we have, um, we will have the behavior smart, positive and responsive behavior tools for educators presentation. Um, and again, that starts at 11 o'clock, but I want to give, give it back to anybody if you have any other questions um, left. And thank you so, so much. This was really wonderful. All right, I'm not seeing any questions come in on the chat or anything else. So again, thank you. Thanks for being a part of our day and for everything that you guys are doing, the work in your district and in your school building is just amazing to hear about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erin. Yep. Thank you very much.